this is a topic that uh, has been um, on and off in nursing, uh, but never really uh, fully accounted for, never really fully uh, tackled. Uh, RNO has done uh, both position statements and we have done um, uh, other activities, uh, but really it requires a lot of more attention. So in that context, I also want to tell you that this will be one of a series of um, webinars that we will do on this. And uh, although we are starting rightfully so with uh, racism and discrimination related to uh, race and ethnicity, we will move to other forms of races of uh, discrimination uh, because I quite frankly, I uh, think that if your RNO doesn't tackle it head on, I'm not sure who will. And we will take accountability of first tackling it inside our own profession, uh, and then worry about how to fix all the rest of the world. Because if we are not um, explicitly attentive to it, uh, we maybe practice racism and discrimination without even paying attention. Uh, so that is critical important that each one of us recognizes that it exists in each one of us and that we be aware what are the actions that we may be doing even if it's not in purpose that may be uh, expressions of discrimination uh, so that's very important and um, and so i may be from time to time uh, not so much to the panelists because they will express their own experiences, but to whoever that asks questions, saying, what do you think? Uh, what actions have you taken? What things have you done that may be perceived as discrimination uh, that you perhaps didn't even think about them? Uh, so let me start with um, uh, asking each panelist to speak for five minutes, no more, uh, about why are you in the panel? what is it that you want to bring to the panel and i do want to for you to use at least two minutes of that in an experience that you personally or your family have experienced with a uh, racism and discrimination um whether in nursing or healthcare or both so let me start with alison dalby alison your floor and uh, susan if you can keep the time or i can keep the time too that's okay that will be great. So Alison, it's 6.55 till 7. You till 7. Okay. Thank you very much, Doris. So um, hello, everyone. My name is Alison Dalby, and um, I was really driven to be part of this panel and participate um, as similar, very much, very much like what Doris was saying, because of what is going on right now in the States and definitely in Canada. Um, I... I have a degree of privilege and I, with the killing of many black and indigenous people, I feel that it makes me, my heart ache. And um, I got in touch with the RNAO because I feel like there's something we, there, things need to change. And I believe that we as nurses and as our larger organization would be much stronger together. Um, along with being a pediatric nurse practitioner, I've worked for many years with the Sexual Assault Center here in Toronto as well and have had the privilege of working with a number of different communities. But unfortunately, some of the most marginalized and most affected communities by sexual assault and domestic violence are often not the ones that are reporting. Um, and I believe that this really has a lot to do with systemic racism and the way that Black, Indigenous, and other people of color are treated, both in our healthcare system and in our society. And it is becoming a, it's becoming something that cannot be ignored, that cannot be pushed into the corner and held down by other issues going on. We need to do something about it. And it's truly my hope that we as a community can do something much bigger together than any one person can do individually. Though that definitely does not mean that there's not 
definite room for individual work, working on one's individual allyship, as well as acknowledging and confronting the way that the pillars of systemic racism have affected each and every one of us in our own interactions. Um, I have been very, very lucky and I can't think of an individual, um, one of my own experiences of racism, um, which again, I believe just puts me in a very privileged position. And uh, I think I've only also used about two minutes of my time and um, I think that's everything that I have to say right now was really my own hurt and my own really feelings that we as a nursing community can come together and create better change than any one of us can do individually. So Alison, in the two minutes that are left, I have a question already for you. Yeah. And while you have been very lucky that you have not experienced racism or discrimination, have you observed any and what did you do? <sighs> Absolutely. Um, I have professionally and personally seen it. Um, personally in, in my living community, I'm living in um, con a condo cooperative. So we have a very large discussion and there's lots of different discussion from other members of my community about people that should or should not be in our condo community. And I, I try to stand up to and sort of present a more non-biased view. Um, but it's certainly hard. It's hard to live, know that I'm living with that around me every day. So have you called it for what it is? Have you said to your colleagues or, or yeah. people in the co-op that that's racism? I haven't yet. Okay, haven't that's yet. your next step then. Yeah, absolutely. Right? So it, yeah. it, it, it's, it's, I think as we discuss this topic and as we move forward, it's very easy to say the collective needs, the collective needs. Uh, you live in your individual space, you all and we all have responsibility to actually stop it, right? So I leave you with that thought for now. Uh, and that will be something that we will be asking each one of us. Um, I think it's important. Uh, Voodoo, your turn. Hello, my name is Hudu Ibrahim. I am a nurse practitioner. I have been um, through the system from BSW to nurse practitioner. Um, what driven me to participate this uh, discussion is I consider myself in my disclosure um, a very proud black woman. Um, I am a mother of five, so I raise young black men and women. Um, I am a nurse, so I have seen um, how systemic racism can easily slip um, to the finest crackers. Um, so I, I consider myself an advocate. I also consider myself privileged. Um, I consider myself um, a role model. Um, if I don't say something, if I don't do something, if I don't speak up for those who can't speak up for themselves, no one else will. So in my opinion, it is each one of us is responsibility. It doesn't matter what, um, how much melanin we have in our skin. Um, it is all of our responsibility to speak up and support those ones that are being, even if it is within your family. Um, in terms of personal experience, um, I would need 350 days to talk about my personal experience. But one that can stack out, the first time um, since I came to Canada, first time I actually felt that I was different was um, when I um, started my PSW body gram. 
and it was the first class and the teacher asked us to explain why we chose like what was the reason we chose this photograph and everyone was talking about their reasons and i said i am using as a stepping stone to nursing <laughs> as i'm new to the country and i would like to proceed to take uh, more courses but i'm not familiar with the canadian academic system and the reaction that teacher the, the the expression of her face was priceless it was absolutely her her reaction spoke more than a million words and i didn't know why but she later approached me and said to me you know darling um even real canadians have difficult time getting into into nursing and i felt so i am not real canadian um, that was the first time I really felt different. Um, and it goes on and goes on. So in my opinion, it is like systemic racism in nursing starts in the classroom. So as you walk in, you're already being judged and you're already being indifferent and you're already being looked at in a different way that you never thought about yourself. So that goes on as, you're, as you progress in your career. I'm not so sure how much more time I have um, with my time, but like I said, I can give millions of examples where it was blunted and it was out there and I don't walk away. I always try to find out why that person is the way they are. And there are some that I lose hope of trying to change them, but I try to change the people who are around them and that support their actions or inactions. And I am delighted to say that same teacher, a few years later, I sat in the same conference table as a faculty of the same college. So that was more then satisfying it to me that I show her not only I can do it, but I can be at the same position that she is. So that is where I feel motivated that if you put your mind into it, you can do it and you will meet a lot of people like that in every corner. Udo, when the teacher said to you, you know, darling, even real Canadians, what did you answer to her? I said to her, like, like ex the, the, she had a lot. You can, you can just, <laughs> I am, I am very planted. Um, so I, I sometimes respond in a way that I didn't even think I was assertive enough. But my answer to her was I, no one has my brain and I don't have anyone else's brain. So basically challenge was on. And I was not satisfied until I sat beside her as a faculty. That's fantastic. I don't know if Birgit is in the audience, but Birgit will relate to this to uh, one of my mentees uh, on the same issue of what you are told um, by, a, by uh, presumptuous people that have nothing better to say, quite frankly, than stupidity. Um, so thank you, Udu, and thank you for being a role model to your children and to the community. Nora, tell us your story about what happened during SARS. Uh, so, so Alison and Udu refer to, especially Udu, to within nursing. Uh, Nora, if you can take it a bit to what happened in healthcare, uh, the difference that you versus your husband, if I recall were treated. That's right. So um, I'm a, a, a nurse practitioner and uh, through an outbreak situation at a retirement home, I contracted COVID and unfortunately spread it to my uh, family. So my husband and kids. Um, but it's my husband is a person of color, minority, uh, immigrant. And he, uh, him and I, our experiences when the, within the health system were so radically different. 
And it really came to light for me when I was reading the story about the PSW Leonard who in um, Toronto who passed away from COVID at work. And that, that, it, that story hit me so hard and reading it and thinking, oh my God, this is what the path my husband was on. And it, if it wasn't for me, I, I don't want to imagine what possibly could have happened. But um, one night, uh, I was feeling unwell, but my husband was getting worse with his respiratory um, condition. He was uh, starting to go in some distress, labored breathing, and I was like, it was like the middle of the night, and I was like, honey, we got to go to the eMERGE. Of course, I couldn't go into the eMERGE, but I dropped him off, and I was like, you tell them that you know, your wife is a healthcare worker and has been exposed to COVID and like has COVID, right? So you need to get tested and everything. And just like the Leonard, he was uh, diagnosed with pneumonia. The doctor actually in the eMERGE told him, I don't think you have COVID, you have a pneumonia. I don't think it has COVID and you can go home now. And that was just after like, uh, and it was a very short visit into the eMERGE. And my experience though, I was, I had to go to the eMERGE also. And my experience was very different going into the eMERGE. I get, um, it was a very nice treatment, lots of questions, nice room. They actually wanted me to stay overnight to monitor, to do some serial blood work and things like that. And it was just alarming the difference, which was, um, it, it was just so black and white. And Nora, do you think that if the same doctor, not a different one, would have seen you, it would have been different? So my question is, how do we differentiate between poor practitioner, which we have many of those two, right. and discrimination, meaning bias, diagnosis, bias, treatment, which we see all the time too. Right. I'm not quite sure how we would see it, right? Because a bad doctor can document well. So how do we actually determine this as to which, which is what? So, but is it just an individual bias? I went by how my husband felt. He felt dismissed. And I think he was more taken back that even though he had explained to the doctor what my work was, that we had COVID and, and he said, no, I don't think that's what this is. So to me, one easy way, first of all, of ensuring that if it's poor practice doesn't happen again, and if it's discrimination doesn't happen again, is to report it to the hospital. Yeah, so because I've gone to the, the hospital. The hospital can clearly see patterns, right? Right. And we've had to do this in the past too. This has happened before. He's had to have major surgery and uh, it's, and I, I uh, so when he's gone in for major surgery, if he's, it's not till I show up that things are actually different. The nurse will come to the room and he'll say, oh, this is the first time I'm actually seeing anyone. They haven't helped me with anything. Or if I've talked to the doctor and they, I start getting phone calls every day to get the updates on how he's doing. And so we've seen this pattern before and when I, mean, I do see it I do bring it up to the hospital I've gone to chief of staff of a certain hospital to explain and express what I've seen um, it hurts of course personally but how do I also translate this to other patients and in the broader population yeah yeah so my I mean my first reaction would be that if this is in the same hospital all the time, I will put it in writing to the president and CEO of the hospital and to the chairperson of the board. Because your husband is lucky that he has you, but not every patient is. That's right. 
That's right. So I feel, and Hudu, to your point about the melanin in the skin, because <laughs> as you can see, I don't have much. I'm very Caucasian, and I feel it's even more important that I do speak up. And I do take that responsibility very seriously, not just, of course, for my family, but for every single patient, because I've experienced, like, yeah. passively as to what they might be experiencing. Yeah, that's, that's, that's the key that we all speak up against. Because if you speak up and I speak up, it's not going to be taken the same way. Um, it might have more weight, just the same, same way you said, you get more phone calls as soon as you show up. Um, so every one of us has different privilege. It's good to use them all. That's yeah. right. Thank you, and thank you, Nora. Let's move to Shirley Davis, please. Hi, nice to meet you. My experience, um, as I, I could say, talk about it for, for, for days, but as you can tell, I have a son, and he is my strength. Um, as a nurse, as you know, I work for CareCore. CareCore is a healthcare agency, and uh, that is by choice, um, because working in a facility, the racism was very difficult to handle. It mentally and emotionally tore me apart. Um, my experiences has been one as, as advocate. My children are my blessing. Um, you know, Anthony as a lawyer um, and anti-black racism and has, has taught me well. I have a daughter who is at Harvard who has taught me also in regards to how to speak and how to confront these issues. Um, from personal experience, um, a particular hospital, I, uh, as a nurse, I called out somebody for carding, uh, a policeman. And from that situation, I was banned from the hospital for saying, the, this policeman reported me to the hospital that I was soliciting on behalf of my son. And I was banned from any facility associated with this particular hospital. And I was not, no due process. Nobody asked what took place. It was just, you're out, you know? And, and this is an ongoing practice with hospitals in regards to uh, somebody says something and it's usually a nurse of color. Nurses that usually work for agency are nurses um, of color, are usually black nurses. And it's because of the difficulty it is securing a full-time position. You know, when we walk into hospitals, we know we're walking in and uh, we're scrutinized, hyper scrutiny. We know everything we do. Dot your I's, cross your T's. You must do that because you are watched. And it just takes one complaint and you're gone. A lot of nurses work out of their community because they've been banned because of a mere complaint. And it's professional practice leaders that do this. You know, um, and when you do call out racism, it's you're told, you're playing the race card. Nobody really analyzes the situation of what's taken place. You know, I'm seen as I'm a bigger black woman, you're the angry black woman. You know, that is always the picture that's being played, the stereotypes that work into these complaints. And how, how do you tackle that? I mean, you can write and you can talk, but at the same time, economically, you are going to lose. You know, the reprisals, the write-ups are, are, are so emotionally draining. You know, it's, it's a mental, it becomes a mental health problem. It becomes depression. I've been through it. You know, as I said, I have the strength of my children um, that support me and say, one day, mom, we will do this together. You know, and this is the day. This is one of the days. You know, I could go on forever, but I'm sort of going to break. Sorry. That's fair enough. We totally understand you, Shirley. We totally understand you. Anthony, you want to add anything? Uh, sure. So, um, so I, I come at this not as a, uh, a healthcare professional, but of course, as is mentioned, as, as a human rights lawyer. And uh, I think it's really important to be able to say that in the work that, that I've, I've been able to do, seeing the ways in which systemic racism has played out in the healthcare system has certainly been heartbreaking, seeing it impact my mom, but then also there are other agency nurses who I get phone calls from because there's a, a network of folks who are experiencing a level of, 
of reprisals or mistreatment and feeling like they don't have the support because of the precariousness that can exist in many times as it relates to agency uh, nurses. And then the challenges that it creates within the nursing profession, again, not speaking as an expert on the profession, but from what I've observed over a number of years, supporting my mom and supporting other folks who've reached out, just for a word of uh, information. Uh, they don't, they're not my clients, but they know I have a legal background, so I offer some direction and some thoughts in the same way that you mentioned, uh, perhaps providing uh, or, or documenting what's ex what you've experienced in writing and sharing it with the board uh, chair uh, and the CEO of the hospital as a way forward. And because of the work that I've done, I've always uh, liked to be able to situate what the individual nurses are experiencing within the context, because sometimes, as my mom was saying, you can feel like you're, it, it's, it's, well, people will, will challenge you about what's really happening to you. Is it really racism? Are you sure they really meant that? Or maybe they treat everybody like this. And so there's a double burden that many racialized Black, Indigenous, and racialized folks end up having to experience, where it's not just the experience of racism that they're going through, but then the burden of having to prove that what, they're ex what they've gone through is actually real. And so I've really, I've, I, I do a lot of public writing and advocacy. And one of the things that I, I say as it relates to that double burden is it's what makes uh, the Black experience suffocating. Because right? not only do you experience the mistreatment or, or, or being singled out or being ignored or not properly treated, but then again, you have to prove that that's what's happening and, and work through that. And so that's an ongoing challenge. But it's also important to note that it's not, it's not about the individual who's suffering that. It is widespread and systemic. And that's why I'm, I'm happy to, to support my mom in this conversation and support this conversation more generally with the RNAO. So, so as I mentioned before, this will be the first of a series of conversations that the nursing community will have. Um, and RNAO is very pragmatic on this. So for example, I don't know if Brittany is in the call. Is Brittany on the call? Or Irmajin, are you guys there? Irmajin is, yeah. Yes, I'm here. Okay, so one of the things that I would like for us to check, for example, Irmajin, is if the college, because I believe the college does not, collect uh, ethnicity and race in their data. And we should push that they do. Because then, when Shirley is telling us, and I believe, Shirley, that you are totally correct, that the, largely the majority, whether it's 60% or 70, of agency nurses are probably from uh, racial minorities, then we can prove it. And then we can start to push that agenda. Or when I say, for example, that the farther you get from the bedside and from the classroom, the whiter you become. That can be proved. But for that, you know, the same as now we are asking, I needed to ask for a long time during COVID, uh, the ministry and public health officials could, to collect socioeconomic status to actually show what was happening with poverty and the communities that were suffering the most in terms of COVID. Here, we absolutely need to do the same. First, inside our own profession and then outside of the profession. But let's clean up our house first before we expect others, you know, in the health system broadly. So that will be an important piece to check. You know, imagine when we renew the registration, if even the college asks. And if it doesn't, well, if it does, we can already start to analyze some data and bring back because it will be important. And if it doesn't, that's absolutely a piece that we should be pushing for. Data is very important. Can I just interject? I think also it's important in terms of race-based data collection. Um, when the complaints are coming in, if we look at who the complaints are against and who is making the complaints. That's why I am saying totally, yes. totally, yes. totally, yeah, totally, absolutely. Okay. Um, I'm taking note just so we don't forget. And Irmatina, I know you are too. So Nora? that's, yeah. It's Nora. In my workplace, I've, it was some of my colleagues who are minorities or black. Uh, I do uh, home care. And 
people are being turned away by clients because they don't like the appearance of the person who showed up to provide the care. I think this is also a very important area. Yeah. yeah. Because yeah. this is happening, not just, I work for a government body, but the agency staff, I see it all the time. Yeah. Yeah. Very good. Um, let's open for questions. I don't know if there are any on the screen. Uh, Susan? Yes, we have um, questions on the screen. And I think Gold Rose, one of our participants, wanted to speak. Can we allow her to? to Absolutely, yes. Experience? So let's give this. I'm going to allow you so to. Gold Rose, just so you know, Gold Rose is all the way in beautiful PEI. <laughs> and I'm so happy that you joined us. So I'm hoping you can uh, speak, Gold Rose. Can you promote her to panelists for two minutes? I allow her to speak. Hello. Yes, great. Can you hear me? Yes. Can oh, you yeah. put her can you put it as a speaker, please? I'll try. In the time being, go ahead, Go Rose. Well, th thank you so so much for allowing me to speak. And uh, hello, uh, Doris, Sir Jean, and everyone else on the panel. Thank you for um, your insights, uh, your um, respectful conversation, which I truly appreciate. I'm part of BPOP. You're breaking out. You know, you know what happened? I promoted her to panelist and we lost her. Let's see. Uh. Okay, there you go. Good, you're back. Hello. <laughs> oh, we can see you too, that's great. <laughs> Okay, so we've got some people, um, but thank you. I really appreciate it. I did join the virtual AGM as much as I could. Uh, fantastic job, by the way. So, as you can see, I'm a woman of color. I'm a registered nurse. And one of the things, you know, when Allison, you were talking about having some concrete action, what I would like to suggest to Doris, and I wrote this down, which I think it's important. You can RNAO perhaps consider this suggestion. Wherever I go, people ask me, where are you from? I don't ask people where they're from. And Darling, I, they ask me too. But so Shirley and Because Anthony, I have an accent. You can relate, Shirley and Anthony can relate, where, and Hudu can, can relate, where are you from? And so the way I answer is I tell them where I work, right? I'm from this place. And then they say, but no, really, where are you from, right? And so what I'd like to make a suggestion, I wrote this down, is that if RNAO can promote, please don't ask me where I'm from. Thank you for being mindful because you're making me uncomfortable. I think we should be right up front and have a place where we can have a position statement or something that says, and a lot of my friends, women of color, even men of color, have uh, told me because of course you belong to communities, like-minded folks, and they also have the same thing. Now I've been in Canada for 41 years. Where am I from, Shirley? Where am I from, Anthony? Like I keep getting that all the time and it really irks me and makes me really mad. And I think I should not stop being mad because uh, it really affects our children, it affects us. The other thing that happened is that I really wanna talk about um, and I think, Nora, you, you know, when, when you present yourself, and, and unfortunately, I'm sorry that your husband was not treated respectfully, is um, when I got uh, um, hospitalized, I almost had to say I'm Dr. Jawani. And I almost had to say that I am an educator working in this particular university to get the kind of respect. Otherwise, my friends call me Galros. I mean, there's nothing wrong with my name. But it's just that you have to raise that status who do as you talk about you know being faculty and then the last thing i want to say because i don't want to take up too much time is that i think as nurse leaders because i'm in a leadership position i think nurse leaders all of us are leaders but as nurse leaders i think we can make changes in policy and rnao advocates that a lot so for example i was appointed as one of 12 members on the poverty reduction advisory council for prince edward island where we were tasked to get the voices of folks living in poverty and everyone else and evidence and help create a poverty reduction action plan for PEI. 
where the government subsequently then committed $68 million uh, to, for the, the action plan. So, uh, but in that, my point is not that. My point is that when I came to Prince Edward Island, people used to say, it's not about where, where you're from, I get that a lot. And we have predominantly white population on the island, as you know. Uh, somebody said to me, uh, three days after I was at one of the large nursing uh, advisory panel and someone said, oh, she's CFA. And I said, oh, what is CFA? Come from away. That's what we're called, come from away. So I said, I said, oh, that's interesting. And then somebody else piped up and said, no, 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 she's not CFA. She is IBC. And I said, what the heck is IBC? Islander by choice. I'm like, what? So <laughs> out of making a difference in policy. So when I was on this advisory uh, council, um, I said that we should refer in the plan Everyone is being Islanders because the Newcomers Association spoke to us vividly that they don't like being called CFA or IBC, but it's a tradition here on Prince Edward Island that unless you've been here for generations, you are an Islander, the rest of us are not. However, in the, uh, the um, action plan, uh, that was, uh, there is, so the minister agreed with me, she happened to be, uh, I connected with her, I spoke to her about this, and she heard me and she said, you know, we'll put a little asterisk that said, this plan belongs to Islanders and the Islanders were classified as all of the people who live on Prince Edward Island. Because after I got called that more than once, I said, you know what? I'm sending 40% uh, of my income tax dollars to British Columbia because I live there and they loved me. I'm sending 30% uh, to Ontario and I'm gonna keep um, whatever is left over for Prince Edward Island because really clearly I'm not an Islander. And so I think in policy, we can make a difference as well. And it takes, uh, as all of you know, lots of bravery and courage uh, and also uh, risking that uh, we will get alienated. So that's all I have Thank to you. Thank you. Thank you. I do want uh, to ask the student, I hope that Mona is a student, uh, because they, they, what you are expressing here is something we often hear. Sometimes it's difficult for students to respond to professor, faculty, because of the unknown potential response that that pro faculty advisor might inflict and the potential impact for graduation. Uh, I don't know if Mona is willing to expand a bit on that. Um, I am not. I, I am not. I'm not a student, but have been a student. Okay. And I know the the feeling of being a student. When professors say certain things, you don't know what's going to happen with your marks. You don't, you know, you have, there are so many issues come to your mind that you say, look, I'll grin and bear it and I'll get through this because I have to get through this. And it makes it very challenging because they just don't feel they've got the voice. And they, sometimes knowing who do you, to whom do you go in that faculty when you're a student? Where do you turn? Mm -hmm. There aren't yeah. many people, you don't know whom to turn to. Yeah. And so yeah. it's a student in, in a bind. It makes it very yeah. challenging. And I remember I got my Aaron in England. And when I came um, to- uh, Just one second, Mona. Yes. Uh, Susan, can you de-promote Gulros and put Mona so we can see her? Because we cannot oh. see her and she's talking <laughs> and it's interesting too. Is that doable? <laughs> I'll, I'll try, yeah. Thank you. Mona, I just wondered while we're doing that, you do have another question about how the data that we're looking at being collected would be used and your concern about stigma being attached to that data. And I just don't want us to miss that question. So once you're finished with this, maybe we can address your question. Well, when, when I first arrived in Canada, I was told I can apply for public health nursing and I was given a test and the result of that test said I wouldn't graduate from higher education. But I recall what my parent had said to me when I was growing up and they said only God can make that decision. So I was going to forge ahead. And I attended a different university, graduated with honors, and I came back 
And I said to the people at the university, I said, here, I graduated. And I said, that test was invalid. But you see, how many young people would do that? Mm -hmm. You know, how many? Sometimes it's, it's very challenging. And in terms of the data, I have heard situations where people refer to Dane and Finch because of some data that was collected. Negative situations. I've seen situations when I worked in British Columbia with First Nations children, when certain data is collected, it, it puts a focus on that situation, but it's a, like it's a target. So it's like a double-edged sword. And mm -hmm. so I often say, I want to read first what the data is going to be. I want to understand who will be collecting the data. So I know if there's bias included inside that re the reporting of the data, how is the data going to be used? Is it going to be used in a very positive way to say this group of people uh, did not receive certain care? Or is it just going to say that here from this particular area, you got these people. So now you could, let's say, for example, at Dean and Finch, you have that grouping where I have, I mean, I'd heard about Dean and Finch, I'd not even been there, but I heard the negative stereotypes. And so if another target is put on there, can you see what happens to young people coming from there? You feel mobilized, immobile, immobile. you can't move. And yeah. then it paralyzes you. Yeah. Yeah, you're, put, you're, you're in a double, double whammy situation. And that's why I said I don't like the term minority. I've never seen myself as a minority, even though I'm a black woman. No. Yeah. I, I, think, do want, yeah. I do want to move to some of the other comments, yeah. uh, if I may. Mm -hmm. uh, Paul Andre, to your point uh, that the, the discrimination against gay people and in particular trans people is absolutely uh, outrageous. We are going to have a webinar uh, and we will ask you to speak and we will bring also Susan who was the first trans person. She's not a nurse. Uh, she's formidable though she got the key. The, the, the city of Toronto key from uh, John Tory last year, and I, I was privileged to attend that uh, because 70% of transgender people um, actually have either had or experienced uh, suicidal ideation. So thank you, Paul Andre, for bringing that on. We will dedicate the whole session to it. Uh, same as we will dedicate the whole session to uh, indigenous uh, people discrimination, which is horrendous in our country, horrendous. Uh, and we just saw two people killed this past in the last 10 days, right? Uh, so I wanted to acknowledge that. I also wanted to acknowledge a comment that uh, a person sent to your way, Shirley, and it says your experiences of anti-blackness and, and are unacceptable and the ways in which systemic racism have impacted you. I see your emotions and thank you for sharing with us. Indeed, Shirley, and to your son, Anthony, thank you for sharing with us and never stop sharing. Um, then there is a comment, I know I commend you for raising this issue and bringing it to the forefront, thank you. Uh, one thing is raising, now we, now we need to do things to um, bring about remedy. As I said, while we may not be able to bring remedy, uh, but only to contribute and to push issues in the health system and in the social system and other justice system and you name it, overall, we will bring uh, absolutely yes, uh, solutions to nursing. It has been way too long, I can tell you. I finished my dissertation in 2010. Uh, I graduated in 2010, so the dissertation was before that. And I remember vividly, vividly, uh, a nurse speaking with me, my, my dissertation, it doesn't matter, the topic was about the social construction of caring and had little to do with anything to do with racism, ethnicity, discrimination, was following people, nurses, all, all nurses, and it was interviewing them. And I remember it was a participatory ethnography. And I remember vividly this nurse that said to me, would you mind interviewing me later on? We just had done a shift together because they call me, they call me now. They want to give me this management position. And I was so excited. And I said to her, go for it, go for it. And she came back about three minutes later, guys, no more than that. 
and she said to me, you know how, how terrible? In the phone, she said to me, come, you meet all the criteria. And when she saw me, she said to me, oh, the position is already gone. So um, this happened and this is real. And I know, and, and Angela, you also will be in a panel in the future. Angela, our immediate past president can tell you of situations that are real. And I know of plenty of nurses that have mm -hmm. not been promoted or not being, uh, and now that Shirley you are saying, and I never thought about this piece, that the majority of nurses in agency mm -hmm. are, are, are nurses, uh, uh, either black nurses or minority, I bet you that also indigenous nurses, we absolutely need to look at this. And the first way to look at this is data. Data, 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 and if the college doesn't collect that data, we will push for it. Um, so you do have the commitment of RNA, so don't thank us. We need to leave marks together and we will do that. That doesn't though leave us, um, uh, a, a doesn't, um, a, a doesn't excuse us from not taking action when we see it and we need to call it for what it is, okay? It's our responsibility, both to one another when we see it, in the language we use, in the actions we do or don't do, and to make people reflect, did you think about why, right? So that people start to change their behaviors. You know, sometimes we don't do this. So sometimes we don't do, I, I believe that most of the time, at least the people I know closely, don't do this in purpose, right? It's just so ingrained in people, but we in purpose need to do well. That's the issue, right? So while we may not be acting things in purpose the way we do, in purpose, we need to remedy that. Um, Marissa, I just promoted Chantel to panelists because she had some questions. Fantastic. I see other comments as a young and black registered nurse. Why don't we learn in nursing schools how to treat patients with different skin colors? The Jarvis textbook is full of Caucasian examples. Good for you mm -hmm. to say that. So when I see my own black people, it's hard for me to provide care to them. Good for you. This is another piece imagine from a policy perspective that we definitely can take on. We definitely can speak with schools. Mm -hmm. We can speak with publishers. We can do letters about that. We can start to influence that. Thank you for bringing that. It had not occurred to me that one either. So thank you. I have been asked where I am from yeah. Um, Oh, that's Angela. Well, Angela, I, I'm, I'm asked all the time huh, because of my accent. Worse even when people say, I don't understand her. And really, if they made a bit of more of an effort, they would understand me. But I think we all need to stand up and answer what Gold Ross said. I am, I am from, uh, from Toronto. You know what I mean? From Toronto. Uh, earlier, it was mentioned... Oh, sorry, we have Chantel and then um, Emma is also wanting to talk. So. I know, I'm just okay. reading the comments that people put some time ago. Earlier it was mentioned that people of color were being turned away from the, consu from the consumer yeah, during, during healthcare visit. How have those situations been handled thus far? I think the word consumer probably was a mistake. Where they denied care or did people feel compelled to care for them? I'm not sure I understand. Steve, you may want to rewrite that question. Uh, Aldina, the nursing school curriculum needs to change, no doubt, absolutely. Um, and I would say building on Paul Andres' comment before, it needs to change both about race, ethnicity, mm -hmm. um, oh. sexual orientation, gender identity, the whole thing, and it's about time. And we can push on that too from our end, from our NL. Um, furthermore, when people are sick, Paul Andres says, they are way more vulnerable. Uh, it is compounding to the situation they're in. I need to tell you, and I'm not going to, of course, disclose the name. This was many years ago. We were still in University Avenue when I got a call from a person at the College of Nurses, absolutely, and said to me, you wouldn't believe the in incredible situation I had and with a very desperate voice and I said tell me about that well this nurse called and this nurse wanted to come dressed as a woman and I said and well it's not a woman it's a man 
And I said, and? And said, well, it will confuse patients. And I said, you know what, so and so? I hope you will get a lawsuit for the college. That's all I could answer. Because it's not the business of anybody how people come dressed. Um, do any of the panelists have innovative ideas for how we can create mm -hmm. equal access to career development opportunities in health, uh, care for black, indigenous, and people of color? Let's put that Brittany on the parking lot for a minute until we get with all the other comments. And then we let the, the people that want to make comments and then we take this on. And if there is no time, we will bring it at the next time for sure. I have experienced racial, racialism in the education settings where my paper assignment were given, to, were given a lower grade and, and I asked the Dean of Nursing to have my, assign, assign, my assignments, that's my apologies, it's me, graded by a second reader professor. Hence, I say to people, I am a citizen of the world when people ask me from where I am. We are on the same page, Angela. I also say that. Mm -hmm. I wanted to also say that it is important we use most appropriate language when discussing topic of race mm -hmm. and racism, mm -hmm. specifically eliminating the word minority as it can be, it can be adding, thank you, sticking to terms like black, indigenous, person of color, mm -hmm. also using terms like underserved, thank you, Mm -hmm. Individuals, communities, groups, rather than marginalized, especially if you are talking about the experiences of others. Mm -hmm. Lastly, it's a sen uh, this is very good, Ria. Lastly, it's essential to call whiteness for what it is, rather than using the word Caucasian. You notice that I said the farther we get from the bedside or from the school side, the whiter we become. Exactly. Mm -hmm. That is very true. I didn't know though is the right term. I said it because that's what I believe. Um, a, we can use sentences such as a white person. I ha as a white person, I, ha I have privilege. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, I can see real pearls here. This is a critical point, mm -hmm. not only uh, who, col who is collecting, but how data is interpreted. Well, I would say we need to look before we ask on how we need to ask the data to be collected. So we will do homework with you guys, uh, especially those of you that have expertise. Chantal, I will leave to ask the question herself. And then Michelle Parent, would a Reneo, Irma Jean and her team create a BPG oh. on anti-racism and discrimination? So that's not Irma Jean, that's Megan. Uh, and we will look into that, can promise at this point, because we have like 20,000 requests of PPGs. And uh, we but do at some have point, the diversity PPG that... Um, we do, but I would suggest it's different. But yeah. we do have a position statement, but it, it, no, uh, we're not saying no. Um, let us think about that because of all the other ones that are going already. Um, like for myself, I do speak French and people think I always come from Quebec, but I am pure Frank, but I am a pure Francophone of Ontario. Okay, and then Anonymous, I think we read this. No, how do we go about mobilizing our leadership? I am sorry, I have real problems with the word leadership. You need to know that. For me, all nurses are leaders. I think the person is referring to executive nurses that's different than leadership every single nurse in direct practice whether np or cns or rn or rpn for that method or whoever that does clinical practice better be leaders in our respective places of work to take action against anti-black racism much like Shirley, i have had a long road with my upper middle management i believe you 100 percent based on what i have seen as well as the union with many horrific experiences of racism, I'm so sorry. From my microaggressions to blunt and open racism, although I see the value in a dialogue about this, but is anyone else tired of talking and ready for action? Yes, we are. I have written as, I have written a letter, I'm assuming to the CEO of my corporation, 
and have received a generic response from our human rights and, and inclusion specialists basically saying nothing at all. How do we go about it? Yeah. I totally believe that, oh my gosh, there are a few others. Um, okay, I think I read the next one. Uh, also, men in nursing experience discrimination, yes. Uh, then I was talking about patients refusing care from colored people, yes, I've seen it and I've answered to those nurses when I was a manager. Um, I have seen also nurses saying they don't want to take care of black patients, by the way, that was in the US, and that didn't get a very positive answer from me. Uh, racism is a learned behavior, yes. If you see young children uh, playing, they don't discriminate 100%, Angela, and I think Ed Hudo was also alluding to that. It is their parents who teach them about differences in people, 100%. Paul Andre, we have trans nurses, we spoke about that. Yes, we will ask them to present. Happy to do that, Paul Andre, I will be talking with you about that. Um, racism course should be part of nursing programs, 100%. Um, so I think Chantal, you wanted to have Chantal, Susan, or you can promote her, Chantal. Yes, yeah, she's ready to go. Hi, so thank you so much for having me um, ask some questions on the panel. So my name is Chantal. I'm a nurse practitioner in downtown Toronto in primary care. Um, I'm also black. Um, I started similar to Hoodoo's story um, as an RPN um, in Brampton and for the last 10 years I've been a nurse. Um, I just want to say hi to Allison. We are from the same graduating class. So hi, it's great seeing your face again. Um, <laughs> um, first of all, thank you so much for taking the time to create this panel as a nurse, I'm sorry, as a nurse practitioner and as a member of the Registered Nurses Association of Ontario since I was a student. I really appreciate us now having the safe space and the language associated with putting this to words and actually saying it out loud without it being awkward or uncomfortable. So I really appreciate that. Um, I, I have a few questions, but just as a few comments moving forward. I'm not sure how we would go about this, but I'm learning as the weeks are going on with these recent events, it's important to elevate black voices. So again, I appreciate the comments coming around from everybody about their experiences um, of other forms of discrimination and things like that. And I'm not dismissing it or diminishing it in any way. I think it's really important if we have focused race-based conversations that they stay focused on race-based so that we can have focused race-based solutions, right? And we don't yeah. get lost in the minutia of having conversations about other issues, which again, I'm, I'm not diminishing them in any way, but it's important that we actually, sorry, my dog is here, to actually engage in these conversations. So- um, Can I ask you a question? Of course. I do want to clarify um, two things, um, simply because I want to, to know your thoughts on that. When you, when you say focus on race base, you mean, not to touch in other types of discrimination or do you mean something else so when i'm talking about anti-black racism i'm just saying that it's great if we focus on anti-black racism i'm not saying that we shouldn't focus on um lgbtq and trans i'm not saying that we shouldn't focus on indigenous racism i'm not saying that we shouldn't focus on um, migrant issues and other things that people are going through because all of that is real and it's true and it's actually happening I'm just saying that when we have our conversations, it's strategic for us to focus on the specific issue at hand, and then we can all work on it together. And it's kind of like, you know, when you, it's kind of like care planning, right? Like you focus on the specific system, and then we work together to, to get solutions. So again, I'm not just diminishing, I'm just saying that in, if this language, if this conversation is about anti-Black racism, it's important that we stay focused so that we can come to solutions together. So I totally agree with you. Um, I, I still have a question. Of course. Um, sorry, I'm, tr I'm taking notes because what you're saying are pearls of wisdom. Um, so, so, would you see a problem if we were doing uh, two sessions on anti-black racism, Chantal, and then two sessions on uh, uh, indigenous racism? and two sessions in LGBT racism. Why I'm saying it 
is because if we were ever to to venture into a BPG on the topic later on, although one is being done now in LGBT as we speak. Uh, perhaps there are aspects that are common and then mm -hmm. some that are very mm -hmm. particular. Yeah. Okay. Right? So let's keep it here to think, not that we should go that way, but let me tell you about also very specifics. And I don't know if you attended the AGM, did you? I wasn't able to, no, sorry. Don't worry and don't apologize, I'm asking. <laughs> Did the rest of you attend the AGM? Any of you? I did. I didn't get in. Yes. Okay. Did you hear? Did you hear my CEO report? No, I didn't. Okay. So my CEO report ended up something like, "I am thrilled and honored that I have had the privilege to work." with the black nurse leader, Angela Cooper Brathway. And hint, hint, I said, there is a call for elections coming up. Yeah. So, so this is all to say that we need to promote more black presidents, more indigenous presidents, more, you know, we absolutely need, so our new, becomes more and more and more diverse and more and more and more understanding of how to live with the respect that we talk in action. Of course, so. I totally agree. And thank you for that. I really appreciate that you took that stance and out loud said it on behalf of the RNAO and other nurses, you know, that this is where we stand. This is what we believe in. Because once people know what we believe in, then there's no question of what we believe in, right? So thank you for taking that stance. Um, again, just to reiterate, again, moving forward, I love the idea of potentially having like two specific to anti-Black racism and other specific to other issues that are going on. But I just think it's really important. It doesn't have to be me, but we just need to elevate Black voices. As Shirley totally, mentioned, there's lots totally. of Black nurses out there. And in meetings like even like this, this is great. And we're having the language, we're having the conversation, but there's no need we have to be careful that no one's speaking on behalf of black people. There are black nurses who have mouths who can open. I am totally with you. Yeah. I'm totally yeah. with you. So Nora, we invited because of the experience with her husband, who is of black. Of course. No, no, right. I'm not questioning why people were okay. invited. I think it's great. I'm just saying that. But I know from where you're coming. I totally know from where you're coming. In fact, that's a big um, source of discussion now in the US where white people are doing uh, the protest, right? Yeah, uh, without a without a single black voice there. Yeah, and so you don't want to have like you know white savior complex because black people can speak. We can stand up for ourselves. We can speak up on our experiences. So I'm gonna quickly go through my questions. I don't want to take up any more of your time. I could talk about this forever, but anyway. Um, so a few of my questions. What are some ways in which the RNAO plans on elevating black voices within the organization? So actively, actively engaging black nurses into positions of executive leadership, because I know Dorothy said leadership is a no, no, everyone's a uh, leader, but executive leadership. And will there be the development of a black nurses working group? So a safe space for black nurses to speak up and advocate for themselves. Um, that's one question. Um, another question is, will the RNAO place some emphasis on the different forms of systemic racism, such as microaggressions or speaking articulately as the BIPOC in the, um, in the education system and informing our fellow nurses of the issues related to racism. So what I'm learning is having conversations with my fellow nursing and healthcare and, and anyone part of our IHPs is that when we say things like, you know, I'm white and I've experienced racism, that conversation, that language, we have to be very careful because a lot of the time, a lot of people believe or realize or whatever you want to say, black racism is actually deep rooted in systemic white supremacy so you can't really be white and say i had a racist experience you know it's kind of like i experienced prejudice but when you saw my face you weren't scared right sorry i'm getting a little shaky it, right. it wasn't the fact there wasn't if sometimes you're in situations and you're white and you're the odd person out and you felt uncomfortable uncomfort um being seen as different that's not racism. That's not systemic racism or ways in which black people are put down, seen as less than and killed, right? 
So we have to be very explicit and careful about that language. And I think it's a conversation that we can have with one another because I don't blame my white colleagues or BIPOC colleagues of, of not having those conversations. I think it's just, we can't shut people down and be like, you're wrong and then moving on. We have to engage, we have to talk, we have to understand, we have to work together so that you know these problems can be solved together. It's not uh, um, shutting people down. So that's one comment. I have a few more. Um, so giving students the language um, and the responses, so maybe like a toolkit development or ways in which they can safely respond to racist language in academia and in the mm -hmm. workplace. So giving them the actual tools and strategies so that when you recognize this being racist, how do I respond without um, fear of repercussion? So a quick example, I've had a situation in a hospital where I was on clinical placement on night shift and I had a patient who was white, I'll, I'll just say, and, and they were elderly. And again, I understand you wanna provide them care, but the patient said to me to my face, oh, they let your kind work here now. And I was just like, ah. Uh, let me provide you care because we're nurses, right? We care, but you can't, I, I can't, there's nothing you can really do. I was stunned. I told my instructor who was a white person who was just like, well, give them their meds. Like, I don't know, <laughs> you know, like you just have to work through it. So what are some strategies, what are some specific yeah. ways? And it's not us just saying a statement of, we will do all we can to be actively anti-racist. Great, what is, what is that? I'm, I'm, I feel like in the last three weeks have been really empowered to say how. Ask our organizations how, whether it be RNAO, NPAO, C CNO, I don't care, but how, how are we, the government of Ontario, how, I need the words, I need the actual, for me, I, I love concepts, but it needs to be operationalized, otherwise it means nothing, like someone said in the comments, um, so a toolkit might be great for students and for nurses and for Black people who are in healthcare so that you actually can pull from the toolkit and be like, I also have my organization, RNAO, backing me up on this, that this is wrong. And I can bring this to my manager. I can bring this to, you know, leaders or whatever the case is, but I have um, a leg to stand on. And Anthony, I would love to know your ideas. There's some ways <laughs> in which you can have specific ways that we can tackle this head on and we can feel empowered as Black nurses to speak up for ourselves and advocate both for ourselves and for our Black patients. So that's another thing. Um, Just to let you know, oh, Sorry, Chantel, um, just to let Doris know that we're, we're just about at eight o'clock, so. Um, oh, I'm so sorry. Okay. That's okay. No, let, let I can Chantal email my questions. We will go can... 10 minutes. Let Chantal please complete yeah, them. Yeah, good. okay. I have a few more questions and comments. I'm sorry. Again, like I said, I could talk about this forever. I should cut me off. It's fine. Um, so what are some ways that we can actively engage with Black student groups to engage with and encourage them to join the RNAL to have the support of the working group? So when I was at um, USP, I was a member of the Black Graduate Student Association. It was only developed in two years ago. Like someone decided we need to have this. And it's just a space. It is creating and holding space for Black voices to be elevated in academia. A lot of the time we just breathe over it. We're like, well, you know, Black people are here. But if I'm honest, in my graduating class of 75, there were three Black students in 2019. Uh, that, that's data, that's numbers, that's race-based data. Like what, what happened there? And how do we create these programs? How do we actively engage with the RNAL? Take a stand and be like, and that's at U of T, much less for Ryerson and the other universities. How do we take a stand and say, we see you, black nurses, we acknowledge you, we think that you're worthy of doing higher education or whatever the case is, and in positions of executive leadership, whether it be um, round tables or um, boards or whatever the case is, if you look around and everyone looks like you, actively tap on the shoulders of Black people. Because I promise you what will happen, we won't overthrow white supremacy tomorrow, I promise you. But you might actually create space and opportunity for Black leaders to speak up and speak on behalf of themselves and not let anybody speak on our behalf, right? And what will happen to when you do that is that um, other uh, Communities. I promise you that won't happen. And I, I, that's a strong promise, but I, I, if you elevate Black voices, it doesn't diminish anybody else. So we have to actively look and engage and then think about these things that, again, I want to say that. Um, oh, I just had a comment about cutting someone off when they ask where I'm from. I, I disagree with it just because when we have the conversation about race, it's actually a springboard for positivity. 
someone asks me where I'm from, I can engage in a conversation maybe like, why are you asking me that question? Like, do you have any concerns about working with people of different races? What are your preconceived notions about race? What are some words? How do you see yourself? Do you consider yourself a, a settler? Are you an immigrant? Like, what are, like, it's, I think it's a therapeutic communication style that we can use. Like, it's our therapeutic communication, as per you know. Like, we can't, we shouldn't shut down someone if I, like, if someone asks me where I'm from, first of all, I mean, I'm not offended by the question, so I'll say, like, I'm, I'm first generation Canadian, my parents were born in Dominica and the Caribbean. Um, this is a conversation that we can have, and we can engage, and we can diminish those barriers of someone maybe pre um, being prejudiced towards you because of your race. But actually, I'm proud of my race, and you should be proud of your race, too. So let's work together to actually, you know, engage and educate and understand. Um, that was one thing. Uh, and then data collection for um, someone who commented on the data collection. It's the start of doing an environmental scan. So it's our way of assessing if there's an actual problem with race in nursing, right? We can't assess if anything's going on if we don't look at the numbers. And if there's statistics that show that nurses work in certain areas, or like Shirley said, certain nurses are reporting on certain other people, I can whine and complain and be frustrated about a situation all I want. I can have feelings in my heart of pain and all these things. That's great. But if I have stats, which stats can love, then we can actually move forward. We can make change. We can, we can organize together and we can actively dismantle those systems that are currently in place that are pushing black people down. Um, again, those are all the questions I was able to type. That's all I have. But thank you very much for this. Uh, sorry to interrupt okay. you. I'm happy to be here, but I have another meeting in exactly two minutes. Sorry, Mona. No problem. So I'll have to go. Thank you. Thank you, Mona. Thank you. Um, so I would like uh, those of you that are interested in working more with us on that. We will have another, another um, the next week actually is on uh, indigenous people's health. Um, in fact, by their request, which is fantastic. We have a long standing relationship with the chief and with others with sign agreements and we're doing a lot of work with them. Um, it's not about discrimination, it's about the work we are doing together, although I want to push the issue of discrimination too. Uh, can you send me an email directly at, let me write down my address there, uh, of those of you that are interested in doing more work with that, with me, um, I don't even see the chat line anymore, it disappeared on me. Yeah, the chat line isn't, it's an can you now, can you put can you put it can you put my uh, email there, please, Susan? D Greenspoon at .ca. Um, If you are willing to put some effort specifically on the issue of anti-black racism, that's the piece that I would like for us to tackle first. Um, simply because on Indigenous people's health, we already have mechanisms going on. On LGBT, we do have also, and I believe it's my impression, my feeling, my impression, my view, and I'm the CEO of Arenio, so I have a good pulse on it, that although we have a position statement and a couple of other things, uh, we are not doing enough, and moreover, um, I'm convinced that in nursing there is a substantive, substantive uh, racism. And I would like for us to take the opportunity to tack tackle it. And I would like actually black nurses to be the ones leading the way with us there. So if any of you are interested, and of course I already see a volunteer on Chantal. So that's what happens when you put too many questions that are important. <laughs> uh, please send a note and, and we will get you guys going and we will give you the space and um, the keys for it. Thank you. So do we need to do clap, 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 Susan, to satisfy yes, well, your, I, dem your yeah. demands? I don't even have tools today. Well, um, you've got hands that you can I make. Have hands. You've got a great voice. I have hands. And we today will say that we are cheering for all the black nurses, another black health professional in Ontario for the amazing work they're doing. That's what we are cheering for. Okay. And a brighter future for them. 
do we need to um, promote people, please? So, so we can see people because I don't see anybody. Yeah, I've got I've got the screen is full on my end, so I'll take a video from my end. Yeah. Oh, fantastic! And, and actually, how about you start again, um, and I'll start my video again. So why okay. are we cheering? What are we cheering for tonight? We are cheering. So we are cheering for our black sisters and brothers in nursing and all the other professions for the amazing work that you are doing and for the leadership that you are providing and because we want more more of your leadership. Thank you. Thank you guys, and uh, next week is at 6.45, and then the following week, we will reconvene, same topic, going more in depth. We will review the suggestions, the questions, the answers, and we will create together an agenda, and you will be part of it, of creating the agenda. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you to the panel. Thanks, Thank you all. Thank you, everybody. Bye. Thank you very much Thank you. to Thanks. everybody um, for a tremendous presentation and for sharing. So to Alison, to Udu, to uh, Nora, to Shirley, um, and to your son. Thank you, Anthony. Very brilliant works of all of you and much appreciated. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks again. Thank you. Thank you, Phil. Thank you.